Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Michael Salter, associate professor of digital art at the University of Oregon, where he teaches illustration and design, including a class called the Do Dollar Store Hack, a one-week intensive course investigating product design developed from objects purchased from the dollar store. Michael Salter works in a number of media, including digital drawing, animation, audio, and an array of print media, as well as found materials and objects. Much of his work is a response to consumer culture. His next solo exhibition in the U.S., entitled Too Much, runs in November and December at the Rice University Art Gallery. His acclaimed Styrobots appeared in a group show, Robot, Evolution of a Cultural Icon, at the San Jose Museum of Art this year. Michael Salter states, quote, as an obsessive observer, I am fascinated, repulsed, and hypnotized by the tidal wave of imagery that our visual culture crashes down upon us every day, unquote. Michael, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me. Can we start at the obvious starting point and ask you how you ended up being an art teacher and artist? Sure. As an undergraduate, I was a marketing major for two years, and uh, I struggled and my grades were evident of that. Um, I remember a five-hour calculus course and a five-hour statistics course, and uh, I, I had this creative inclination. Certainly, as a kid, I was, I was big into drawing, um, though right up to college, it was never really nurtured at all. Um, high school, I never had an art course. When I switched to graphic design, which I thought, felt was sort of the creative part of marketing, um, I was going to get into advertising and graphics, but purely graphics, the act of image making was what drew me to um, really an art practice as an undergraduate. And at Miami University of Oxford, Ohio, uh, I had a very liberal art, um, traditional studio approach to a BFA, meaning I had to take all the studios and try all the media. Um, in so doing, I acquired a degree in sculpture as well because it was, you know, it was an amazing experience for me. So I have this uh, double major, double concentration in the same for the, under the same degree. Um, in the, my later years as an undergrad, I worked with some teachers, and I don't think this is unique for teachers, but I worked with some teachers who were really quite amazing. Um, they, they lived the life that I wanted to live, they, their work was amazing, and the relationships they had with the students, with me, was, was so admirable. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to be a part of that. Um, so, th and that's, that's really why I started to, or applied and started an MFA program. Um, really, by the end of that, I wasn't so sure I wanted to teach, uh, but, but the actual physically doing the teaching is, is such a, an amazing experience for me. I couldn't avoid it for too long. You avoided it for a little while, I believe, if yeah. I got this right, by designing t-shirts for skateboarders, snowboarders, surfboarders? That's right. I did uh, what most graphic design majors do when they head into the design industry, as I hit some tr sort of trench level positions in uh, in-house art departments. And I acquired some um, responsibility and got to explore some creativity, but in a year or two I was tired of making somebody else a lot of money. So I partnered with a friend of mine who had a similar position and we started our own design company and I did this for about five years. And was very successful. Um, we served some of the biggest sportswear industries in the world. Um, Burton Snowboards, Quicksilver, Dakine, Billabong, huge you know, participants in that, that, that industry. Um, but really being part of that, of the, of the consumer formula of feeding the world with these goods uh, started to not settle too well with me. So there's a definite connection between that piece of your life experience and the, the art you make now that's a oh, reaction yeah. against consumer culture? Yeah, absolutely. I, I use this, in, you know, this story frequently is I used to be able to watch TV and see the Olympians wearing the, the goods that I had designed and I thought, wow, that's great, you know, and I could go to the mall and see, wow, I did that shirt and I did that. And, uh, you know, it feels great to see that kind of exposure and see your work, but at some point I would see my stuff, and I won't use the, the national brand name, but I would see them at a store that sells sort of last year's inventory. It's new, but it's cheaper because it's last year's, so I would see my work there at a discount. I would think, well, that's, that's still good, right? It's still out there. I'm still part of it. Um, and then I would see my work eventually at thrift stores. So I was watching my work or what I was producing into the system kind of flow through from the highest retail to the lowest. Uh, a little bit of research turns out that uh, 
after the thrift stores are done with them, they put them in a truck and sell them at the Mexican border by the pound. Um, so I really felt like I was part of a big monster that I didn't want to be a part of. Um, at, critically, at that same time, I realized that using design language in an art context was possible. I'd always treated sort of making art and doing graphics as something very separate. Um, so then I started to apply this design language of graphic design, logo types, branding, in an art way to comment about the consumer culture that we're a part of. That's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask you next, which was how you would distinguish, how you, you would define the difference between design and art. You know, it's, it's interesting because it's always something that my mind is sort of struggling with. Mm. Um, and, there, there, you know, today there is no difference. Um, f you know, I, I always think about the Charles and Ray Eames part of the design formula is that the more parameters there are, um, the more challenging it is to be brilliant through those parameters. So if you put things like a budget and a client and a time constraint, in order to make the most beautiful solution, you have to really be smart. Now, I love that challenge. And I think if you look at art making, it's very similar. I have something I want to say. I have a place that it has to be said. I have a particular audience or range of people I want to speak to. It's the same thing for me. It is a, it is a series of parameters that I have to squeak through to, to, to communicate very clearly my idea and to be honest about it the whole time. Who do you see as your audience? You know, it's, it's interesting. I was asked recently in an interview if because of my early career was in alternative spaces and uh, you know, sort of underground galleries, if I was editing my audience at all. And I, I it's kind of an odd question. But the fact is I've never really had the pleasure of editing and I wouldn't want to. You know, I think, uh, I think the, the first important answer to that question is for me, artists can't make art for artists. Artists can't make art for academia. Artists can't make art for collectors. They have to make it really for anybody who wants to see it. Um, I have, at every level throughout my life, made myself accessible to make that bridge for people. If there's someone who's never been to a gallery, I want to give them a five-minute explanation that they can sort of preface before they go see the work. Um, that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> If someone can get closer to the work or anybody's work because they've seen an artist sit and talk about it, I think that's fabulous. Uh, so there's, you know, I can't define my audience. Whoever will walk, you know, cross the threshold to look at it. Which means you have to do what is of inherent interest to you first and foremost. Absolutely. I'm, you know, I've been committed to really essentially to the same concept for many, many years, maybe 10 years total, maybe more. Um, and, and that is, uh, really an awareness of visual culture, my relationship to what I see, and how that affects the way I think. You know? So if we could go back to a key phrase from that quotation I read in, in our introduction, sure. how do you respond to this tidal wave of imagery that we are subjected to? I'm assuming that's central to your work. Yeah, well it's difficult to be even remotely objective because we're assaulted constantly all the time. Um, it's kind of a, a, a vigilant task of of media literacy and uh, a good portion of uh, conspiracy theory and uh, you know at the same time I find myself a big player in it like I'm a media junkie I love reality TV and fast food and sneakers and I mean I love the stuff but at the same time I think I have to be critical of it and I have to be analytical of something that I'm such a um, you know I don't want to say I'm a victim I've, I've I think the relationships like that of a, you know, a car crash or a train wreck is you don't want to look, but as you pass by, you have to peek. Um, that's how I see my relationship to that. It sounds like an uneasy, frightening, overwhelming relationship. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what I find is that the closer I look, the stranger it becomes. Um, you know, the world is filled with these images and objects that that are supposed to be very universal in nature and supposed to be very powerful and authoritative. But when I separate everything out and slow it down and just take one or two of these images, they appear so bizarre and so strange to me. Um, it, it makes for great research and, and for great discussion because I mean, I make logos that actually are motivated by the absurd. And that alone is a very strange thing for people to get their head around. But if you have a relationship to this language, and then I introduce it for no reason or for a you know, subtly illogic reason, um, 
what is your relationship to it? Are you forced to build a narrative? Are you, uh, are you confused? Are you comfortable when you're confused? I think I'm rambling, but... Well, let me ask you, let me direct you towards sure. another question I have, which is the relationship of technology and mm. the artwork you do. How does technology fit in your work? Uh, it's a good question, and I think it's part of the reason I'm a, I'm a good fit in the program that I'm in here. Um, technology for me has is, is just always been a studio practice. It's been one of the things I had an option to use. Um, I was drawing on a computer when the Mac Classic was, was first introduced to colleges, and that's one of the earliest sort of phases that college students were you know, using the computer for anything visually creative. Um, since then, I've never stopped drawing, so it's always been sort of a, just a natural option for me. The, the problem with the term digital art or art and technology is that it often rides on the, the power and the, and the pizzazz of technology. And only now, at this point in our sort of current history, are we able to say that it's been around long enough that I can use it with some sensitivity. You know, that it's not the first thing I hit somebody over the head with, that it's actually just something I use, as I would a paintbrush or a, you know, anything else, sculpture, anything. So you've actually said that you don't consider your work part of the digital arts movement, but you use a computer much as you would use a pencil, is uh, that correct? Absolutely, and in class I call it that. It's a very expensive pen. You know, I never had to use a ruler since I started using a computer, but that's about it. Um, I'm committed to drawing. I always have been, and it's a big part of my own education and how I teach. Um, like the hand to paper, the connection between your eye, how you see, and how you translate it to paper, ultimately important for an artist, um, no matter what you practice as your favorite media. Um, so I'm invested in that, and it's, for me, a lot of it happens on the computer, but it's all about drawing for me. Away from the realm of drawing, I have to ask you about your colossal, monumental Styrobots. Could you explain how you started making those? Sure. It's interesting. Like, my approach creatively is, is, is really driven by a kind of a subversion. You know, I was always inspired by the Dadaist movement and by Duchamp. Uh, the ability to take something and recontextualize it and, and make people think twice about it. I think it's a very interesting idea. So I have a long history of basically finding refuse and stuff and assembling it and modifying it and looking at it again. And there's a certain magic that happens, um, if it's done right, where you look at it for the first time all over again. Um, I, I really just looked at these styrofoam chunks as robotic in nature and I was just sticking them together and I thought, wow, this you know, looks like a robot. And very much the way a lot of my work happens, it was not, it was not well thought out in the beginning. I just did it, and then, you know, as an artist, I'm sort of required to sit back and ask myself, why, what does this mean, what's motivating me? So really, it, it came from a very innocent place. Um, my, my process is really simplified, because I can, especially in the academic realm, confuse it. For me, I want to make what I want to have, or make what I want to see. That's the first thing I have to do. And then I ask myself all the very important questions about where it fits in, where it doesn't fit in. Um, what's, what's really motivating me. But the robots came from basically sticking refuse together. It was a, it was a, a material that was readily available. Um, they were around for a couple years actually before I started to realize what they, what they could mean, what they, what they meant to other people. They have a, a multi-level read to them. And, th and the first read is it's just a giant robot which just kind of tickles a lot of people, including me. Um, it's just kind of cool to see a giant robot. That there's that some sort of instinctual generational thing, my relationship to technology and science fiction, I don't know. Um, and, but I think the magic happens when you look at, that, at the robot itself, you get past the robot and realize that this thing's been constructed from really something that we throw away. And it, it sort of fits the mechanical nature of a robot so perfectly well. Um, and it's almost too, too well, like I feel very um, you know, I feel very modest about it. It's just, it's not that I was lucky, I guess. Maybe I was. But I think it's a really kind of an interesting idea. Good enough that it's the kind of thinking that I think translates to other disciplines. Like, how do we take something that we already have a relationship or a knowledge of or perhaps an abundance of and all of a sudden change this into something that's magnificent or new or different? 
And I think it could be applied in a lot of ways. It clearly strikes a chord. You've had a huge amount of attention with the Styrobots, right? Yes. Is there one or are there more than one in the Rice University show? No, there'll be one very big one. One very big one, yeah. as in how big, can you tell us? Well, I don't know because I haven't made it yet. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, and he'll have sort of an unusual gesture. Usually they stand sort of stoic and, and you know, still, obviously, and they seem a bit burdened. But this one's going to be seriously burdened. He's going to look almost defeated. He'll be uh, sort of crouched in a corner, um, you know, relaxed and exhausted looking. Any particular reason why this one is going to bear the weight of the world more heavily <laughs> than the others? Um, well, usually the, the connections between my work, because the media range is so broad, is tenuous and difficult. And I like that. I sort of play to that. I challenge people to sort of make the connection. But this is going to be a really obvious connection. The robot is going to be exhausted by his exposure to simply too many messages. So the, his surrounding this sort of defeated, exhausted robot will be approximately 300 graphics, each applied to the wall separately, um, like a giant, massive wallpaper billboard, if you will. Um, so he will be reacting to too much. I understand. Okay. The poor guy. We have to feel for him. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I expect that the element of absurdity in your work and in your approach to your work is one of the things that makes students respond very well and, and quite quickly to your teaching. I Can you so. talk about the interaction between your own making of art and your teaching? Sure. Um, yeah, I think part of my experience recently have been a, uh, having been a designer several years ago is, is kind of something students relate to. I mean, I, I designed t-shirts for these big companies and it's kind of fun to think about that as, a, as an option. So there's a connection there. And I'm glad to bring that. I think it's kind of interesting uh, material to, to relate to. Um, I've totally lost your question. It was how you manage the relationship between right. your own artistic production and your teaching. Right. It's an, it's an issue for all of us who teach, how we bring our own work into the classroom, but I think you have an especially tight relationship, as you were explaining to me earlier. So how do you bring your own work and your own approach into the classroom? Um, I think another thing that the students appreciate is my use of a lot of media. They want to be told they can use anything, and not not particularly here, but in general, art and academia wants to focus people in a singular discipline. Um, they're excited about seeing somebody like myself, I think, who can use a bunch of different things to say one singular idea or focus on several concepts. Um, what I bring back is these, this idea that I, I'm making work about my world. And, and I want to instill immediately that that's an option for all the art students that I have. That when you're digging down for something to motivate you, what are you better at responding to than what you're exposed to every day, all day? And I, don't know, I, I find that really exciting. You know, I'm still passionate about the, the way the world looks around me. And it, it's kind of exciting to set forth to students the idea that you're kind of responsible what, for what my visual culture is going to look like tomorrow. Like, hopefully I'm playing a part of it now, but you guys are definitely it. Um, so I, I think that's exciting as well. But I try to really make a parallel action between my own practice and what I teach. The projects align something that I might do myself. Um, they are somewhat subversive in nature. Uh, they require students to take a look at the world, um, take back what they've seen, synthesize it, and reintroduce it, which is essentially what I do in my practice. Um, it, it's challenging. It's, it's hard to be honest and clear through that process. Uh, but so far, I've, I've worked with really great students. And, it sounds to me like the dollar store hack course fits that defi definition pretty much perfectly. We teach students who are part of a shopping mall generation, and I'm Absolutely. sure they're all familiar with the dollar store. What kinds of objects did they pick to work with? Well, they really, they, they were successful at doing the magic that I hoped they would. You know, they made a lot of sort of functional home goods and uh, an array of decorative objects, uh, but my heart sort of lies in the most experimental sort of theory-based stuff. There was a young woman who made a, uh, a bra that had an MP3 player embedded in it. And there was another woman who did um, pregnancy test kit earrings. And, you know, these obviously have no practical value and they won't go to, you know, into manufacturing. But I think that they're whimsical, they're funny, and they, they do what I want students to do is sort of take what's out there, flip it on its tail and bring it back. Um, it causes us to look at the world differently. 
Yeah, I can understand that. I also understand from what you're saying that your mode of working uh, integrates the production piece of art and the display piece of art, and that sounds like it's the concept behind Lump and Lump West. Mm. Is that true? You've let me put a little context around this. You've created a project space called Lump West, mm -hmm. and it's both a gallery and a studio. No, yeah. it's it, it's really just a gallery. The project okay. space itself is. Uh, is initiated from my work with Lump Gallery in, in Raleigh, North Carolina for 10 years, which is an alternative space dedicated to emerging work of integrity. And that, that's really as simple as it is. Emerging work of integrity? Sure. Of artistic integrity? What sort of integrity? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, sincerity of actual honesty. Um, there was never a, a it, it's not a profit gallery, although they're not uh, classified as not-for-profit. So it's a paradigm that allows this gallery to exist without having to sell what's in it. And the basis of that for a formula is really a beautiful idea for artists to participate in. Um, for me and most people I know, as soon as money becomes part of the equation, the work changes. And to eliminate that is a really ideal situation. So that worked for 10 years there. And when I came here, my, you know, my former colleagues at Lump Gallery said, you should do it. So there's re this very small space in my backyard. It, uh, I refinished it, I lit it, and uh, um, for the first three years we had several, you know, quite a few shows. We're in sort of a lull right now because I can't seem to garner the, uh, the help that I need, but it's starting again. It's by no means defunct. Um, because that was very elemental in my early career, is having those kinds of places that just said, work that matters needs to be seen. Whether it was making any money for the gallery owner or not, is Absolutely. that the, the, the point? Absolutely. Um, yeah, beauty wasn't, beauty or commerciality, it had nothing to do with why it would be shown. So whose work do you display in Lump West? Um, I've shown former students. I've had uh, group shows that have gone to other alternative spaces throughout the country. Um, I had a former colleague who curated a show that had work in it from around the world, really. Um, there were small, and that was an interesting show, there were small uh, videos shown on teeny tiny MP4 players, and those were put in the gallery. Uh, so obviously that was kind of an interesting media and a difficult media to commodify, uh, but it was an opportunity to see and be in the middle of a show that you could rarely see, you know, particularly in our region. How do you find viewers for the work that you display in Lump West? Sometimes we don't. I've had some pretty low turnout. Um, I, I really function as an idealist in many ways. Provide the space, put good work in it, don't worry about that, anything else. If people come, that's great. You know, we get on the local calendars and word goes out, but it's, it's just about the, the act of doing it seems to prove itself as, as right and true in the end. What, work, what direction is your own work taking these days? Um, well, fortunately, because uh, technology is, is just at a lightning pace it, um, for output for artwork, as in uh, uh, taking a digital image and seeing it, uh, whether it's printed in dimension or printed flat, that has become so accessible and so cheap, I'm just going to keep pushing media-wise where my work can be realized. I think it's pretty exciting when a flat drawing can become a sculpture, which can become a painting, which can go back to a flat drawing or another sculpture. I like this kind of fluid movement through media. So formally, that's kind of where it's going, but conceptually, it'll, it'll, it'll still be about you know, what I see and my reaction to it. Are you still sculpting? Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I imagine the, the, the term sculpting to be something with a chisel and a hammer, which I don't yeah. do, but. Then maybe you're sculpting those robots out of styrofoam? Absolutely, I just finished one last week and uh, it's gonna go to the uh, Pulse Art Fair in Miami in December. Is it true that people pile styrofoam in the corridors outside your office? <laughs> they do, <laughs> uh, too much so. Um, and I'm very grateful, actually. I had to put up signs that said I just couldn't keep any more of it. I had so much of it. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's stunning how much turns up when you ask for it. It's amazing. I don't know where it goes if I don't collect it. I mean, it's going in a pile buried somewhere on the planet, which is crazy. There's huge volumes of this stuff. Yeah, in a sense, you're really helping the recycling effort by building I, your... I know. I mean, I, I guess so. I mean, it, you know, I just read a, a quote by Buckminster Fuller that said something like... Uh, Pollution is only something that we haven't thought about what to do with yet. 
thought oh, that was perfect. pretty beautiful. You could cross-stitch that on a doily and hang that above <laughs> exactly. an installation of your work. Exactly. <laughs> Do you ever think about uh, the old distinctions between high culture and low culture, or are those terms that are no longer relevant? Um, I think they are relevant, particularly, you know, my own work is starting to see itself into a, like a high collector system. It's very interesting, but I, I want to always confuse them where it goes. You know, I, I'm very fond of selling a sculpture or a drawing for a lot of money. I love that. But I'm also very fond of giving away a limited edition t-shirt um, or a sticker. Um, high and low culture is, is you know, our, our access to all those things via the internet and media, um, I see this wonderful meshing now and I love to confuse them, I love to play them against each other. Um, it's something I'm very conscious of. What about the domestic versus international? I know you, you have a lot of reviews and publications in countries other than the mm -hmm. U.S., Germany, Spain, China, Hong Kong, Italy, Belgium. You exhibited work in Brussels. Mm -hmm. Are you actively cultivating an international dimension to your own exhibits? Um, again, that the idealist in me comes out. My job is to just make images and objects. Um, they do the work for me, as in the work does the work for me. Um, I really can take very little credit for it. I have so much more energy when it comes to going to the studio than I have for like working the business part of what I do. I just need to make good stuff, you know, interesting work. That, uh, that has always done the best for me, sort of internationally, regionally, everything. Make good work. Did it give you anything unexpected when you ran a five-day digital media workshop in China? You were at Shandong University, I believe, right? Yeah, it, well, that specifically was a pretty amazing experience. Um, Fifty students, uh, only a half a dozen or so knew any English. Um, I had an amazing translator. My entire experience at Shandong University of Art and Design was amazing, but I went to that class thinking it might be sort of software oriented and very technical, and my rapport with the students was so good, and in that short period of time we were to have able to have some very frank discussions about visual culture in China. They're responsible for the visual culture in China and how that will play in the entire globe. Um, so in the end it was a pretty moving experience. Michael, we're, we're rolling around to the end here. When will we get a chance to see your work locally? Um, I, you know, I don't know. There, there hasn't seemed to have been a lot of opportunities locally. I'm, I'm open for discussion with anyone anywhere. I just got a call yesterday from Japan about uh, putting a, a giant styrobot in an ad campaign of some sort, which I won't do, but, um, you know, the, uh, my work is out there. I'd talk to anybody. You know, I don't know what the opportunities are in the near future locally, though. Well, then, maybe in the meantime, we need to come to Lump West. That's, that would be great. <laughs> come on down to my, my backyard. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for me as well. We've been speaking with Michael Salter, an artist and associate professor of digital art in the School of Architecture and Allied Arts. Thank you for watching.